Okay, so welcome to our um, webinar on preparing for component one, which is the content knowledge webinar. We don't anticipate that this will take the full two hours that we had um, scheduled for that, but um, just wanted to welcome you all for coming. Thank you for coming. And if you're listening to the recording, I hope you find this information useful. A little bit of information. We've already talked about how to um, mute yourself and to unmute. Um, make sure if you guys have obviously found the chat box. But um, if you wanted to chat with anyone directly and didn't want the whole group to see that, you can select that choice when you um, where it says to everyone, you can um, click on that carrot and just choose individual people if you want. If you're having any problems navigating Zoom, don't hesitate to just reach out either. Holly? All right, well, my name is Holly Bloodworth. I'm an early childhood generalist, and I am the president of the Kentucky National Board Certified Teacher Network, something we would love for you all to join now. You're eligible to join now, or for sure when you get certified, we want you in that network. I am a teacher at Murray Elementary School in far western Kentucky. I, uh, I teach literacy and drama uh, in an elementary setting, K through three. And my name is Suzanne Farmer, and I'm also an early childhood generalist. Um, I'm on leave from the Danville Independent Schools, and I work on a grant with the National Board called the Network to Transform Teaching. Um, Kentucky is one of the sites in that work, and I work with um, the Education Professional Standards Board, the Kentucky Department of Education, and the Kentucky Education Association as um, partners in that work, and also Holly's um, with the network, so that we have teachers at the table um, through the Education Association and through the network to inform that planning and work um, for our state supports. So, um, and um, Holly and I both um, certified around the same time. We've both been renewed, so we both Mm, I guess it's been uh, like more than 10 years since both of us have certified. And um, so some of what we, you know, some of this process has changed a little bit since we went through, but we have both piloted um, some of the changes as well. So um, just to give you a little context of our personal experience. This is our disclaimer um, because we're going to do our best to answer questions, but um, if you have a very specific question or we're uncomfortable answering it or you want to double check, the um, always the definitive answers come from 1-800-22-TEACH or if you'd like those answers in writing, you can email support at pearson.com. Yeah, Holly and Suzanne said so, Carrie, at all. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we have actually gotten questions from people and even referred to like uh, the reference guides and said well it says on page 10 that this is what you need to do and let's say somebody will then write and see if they can make an exception or you know and and there have been times when they've gotten a different answer by asking them directly so just Put it out there that um, if there's a question that you really are wanting to get a definitive answer, our feelings are not hurt, and we definitely encourage you to double check with, with them. And if you uh, have time, it's always better to do an email so you have a written reply. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So don't wait till the last minute to ask your questions. No, because it can take some time to get those answers back. So, all right. And um, I think we're good on norms because we've got such a small group. We don't need to really worry about managing a crowd. So I think we're, we're comfortable there. Um, have you all already made your appointments for your assessment centers? May 20th. All right. Okay. Coming and up. June 2nd. Okay. So you guys have plenty of time. I think. Where are you going? Nashville, Lexington. Okay. I did mine in Lexington. I went to Nashville. So um, it's one of the things that you uh, may want to consider is a strategy um, that 
We'll talk a little bit about some of the steps that you're going to want to go through and some things to consider, but I recommend that when we're finished with this call, you take some time and actually map out some goals of what you want to break it, break it up over the course of however many weeks you have left. So I know that um, when I was studying, I had a set amount of time that I wanted to devote to intensive studying for this. I mean, I was preparing for a while, but then I had a, a block where I said, okay, for these eight weeks, I'm gonna really intensively study for this exam. And, um, and I blocked it out based on where I felt like I needed to spend more time than others, prioritizing what I felt more prepared for. And that way I knew that this is the week that I'm really gonna be thinking about this topic and this is what I'm gonna do. And it really helped me to, to manage my time and my studying a little bit. So you may wanna consider that strategy. You'll have enough time to divide up some of that work over the, before your test. is literacy. Sam, what is your certificate area? Was that library media or was that Brittany? Brittany yeah. was literacy. Was Sam yeah, library? Sam's library media. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't see it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So um, where would you say you all are right now in um, preparing for your assessment center? Like gathering information, getting started, planning for the assessment, um, practicing, actually writing prompts. All right, Sam, it sounds like you got a good start. Okay. All right, great. So you guys are both already getting there. Have you, either one of you used the platform yet? The Pearson View platform? We'll talk about that during the call, but curious if you've tried that. Okay. Hmm. Was you, were, were you on a Mac or a PC, Brittany? Okay. Hmm. Were you at school? Hmm. I just wondered, because sometimes it could be like maybe there's something that blocks it, depending on where you are. So the, our big... It was down for um, some kind of um, uploading or something it said on the site the last couple of days. Okay. So if you do it in the last few days, that may have been the problem. Um, our overall agenda that we were going to talk about was we were going to look a little bit at the selected response items, of course, the constructed response items, um, a little bit on the scoring, some testing tips in the assessment platform, and some studying tips. Um, if you have things that are not on that list that we you find that we're not covering or, or that you want to add, we can do that too. So just let us know. Um, <clears throat> the big idea of this assessment is really making sure it's core proposition two, um, that teachers know the subjects they teach and how to teach those subjects to students. If you all haven't already seen it, National Board has added a resource on their website that's an updated explication of the FICO propositions. It's a really nice resource and it's free. It's in a PDF version um, and it's the what teachers should know and be able to do. Um, one of the, so in the core prop two section, it starts with this whole idea that if one cardinal principle of teaching is a commitment to the welfare and education of young people, another is a commitment to subject matter. Um, and we're going to talk about how much, how this is reflected in the weighting, but that this is a is huge idea. Um, one of the things that really strikes me when I look through this explanation of core prop two is that how much you can't do that's important with the how we teach it to kids if you don't have a firm grip of the content so um it says you know that you really you it requires that it's not just that you have a surface level understanding of your content like reciting dates or memorizing multiplication but that it requires that 
you have a substantive knowledge by exploring the domains and being able to make connections for kids to become fully engaged in the learning process. So connections between subject matter so that you can really teach interdisciplinary, connections to things that students are really curious about and it's important to them by making the content relevant. So this um, assessment center is the way that, one of the ways that National Board is ensuring that you really have content knowledge at the depth that's required to be an accomplished teacher. So Holly and I mentioned we're both early childhood people. Um, and Brittany, I know you're in an elementary, um, but anyone who's also looking at the um, higher end of the developmental continuum, um, what we've noticed are some of the trends that we see across the assessment center um, across component one is that the earlier you are on the developmental continuum with your, with your certificate area, um, the more likely it is that your questions are centered around pedagogy, um, how to teach some theory things, maybe some student misconceptions, looking at student work, really considering scenarios of how you would teach content to specific students. And the older you fall on the developmental continuum, the more likely your questions are going to be just solving the problems yourself or answering content questions or maybe even making connections between specific ideas within that content. Not to say that there's not any student questions in the older grades, um, but it's most likely going to be, um, there's, a, there's a higher percentage of questions that are really going to be geared around just showing that you know how to do it rather than right. that you know how to teach it. Which makes some sense if you're thinking about it. So I don't need to identify a triangle. <laughs> As a preschool teacher, I need to make sure that kids know how to identify a triangle um, and really understand what triangles are. So, any questions about that idea or anything? All right, and we don't have anybody on the call right now that falls under one of these specialty areas, but just to flag this in case anybody's um, listening later, um, that there are some specialty areas that will impact your um, component one assessment and and those are listed here so cte english is a new language exceptional needs specialists and science and um holly and i also felt that it would be important to also point out world languages because they you choose french or spanish but that might be addressed more on the um the test that those the the specialty tests that those teachers have to take in addition to the, the component one exam. So if you're in one of these areas, you're going to have some special instructions within your instructions to really let you know how that's identified and addressed. All right. So um, when you uh, when you go to your uh, different um, certificate areas I, I can't just these okay I think there you go okay so um, this kind of breaks down uh, when you let's see where did we find this this was in the um, shoot let's see is it under component one mm -hmm. uh, it's in the component one directions for like this would be the this is in the reading language arts early middle to put this is actually the one that um, Brittany is doing, right? Mm -hmm. So, this, so would, this is the selected response table at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so it breaks it down to what standards are gonna be focused on for this component and the, the weight of the, the questions as far as how, like 20% of the 45 questions will be geared around those standards that are listed in that first box and about 25% of the 45 questions that you will have will be based on those equity, learning environment assessments kind of standards. So it kind of helps you know where the weight is for the different construct, the, um, just the multiple choice kinds of questions, and then which standards are emphasized in those different questions. 
And I think uh, it would be really good to maybe list those questions, uh, list those standards like you probably did in your other components and kind of go through your uh, standards and jot down important things or things that you need to go back and look at, like child development theories. Like I would want to find a textbook or something and kind of revisit some of those theories. Um, looking at knowledge of assessments and selecting and administer, administering assessments. I would want to think about literacy and write down different, different areas of literacy and assessments that could line up under those different areas of literacy like vocabulary or fluency or comprehension and have those kinds of things all set in my mind because I know I'm going to have questions that deal with that. Um, looking at uh, reading and writing across the curriculum, I'd pull a, good, a couple of good books on that and really make some specific list of ideas and so that I would have ideas for if there's a constructed response for that, but also in the in the selected response, the multiple choice type questions, I'd want to have all of that fresh on my mind. Um, Suzanne, anything else? Well, I just was going to show, um, we've got copied this and highlighted a couple of these different, like where Holly was talking about the standards, those are right here. Now, in some certificate areas, you're going to find fewer standards listed. And that's okay. So just focus on the ones that they're listing for your certificate area. And um, if they're, like for some of these, if they're listed multiple times, you may want to really prioritize that one a little stronger. Um, you know, it just depends on each of your certificate areas of, of what's listed here under the standards. And really, when you're reading that standard, you may have read it already and thought about, oh, these are the things I do in my classroom. You may want to look at those standards again with the mindset of these are the things I need to know. Um, do I really know these things? And could I answer multiple qu choice questions on this? Am I gonna really feel strong if I was given questions based on this? And what would some questions look like knowing them through the light of the standards? So the standards are your way of like getting a glimpse of what National Board expects. And like looking through those standards, I only see, I'm, I'm not sure how many there are for literacy, but it looks like maybe 10 and 11 are the only ones that I don't see. And there are some that, um, these, this, is, this table is very different for each certificate area. There are some certificate areas where I've seen only one standard listed. So it's really very different. So just keep that in mind when you look at your table. Um, you find that where it says component one. Oops, sorry. Uh, what? I was just reminding them where you go to to find that. Yeah. Under, under your certificate area. And it, yeah, your component one directions that you download on that table. So this is in that, that document. The other thing that um, ha I have actually given people as a piece of advice is, Holly mentioned there's 45 questions. Five of those are field tested. So they're actually going to be thrown out. And you don't know what five. But of the 40 that count, approximately, if you look at this table, in that first section where it's 20%, that's about eight questions. So, and about 10 in the next section and eight in the next and 14 in the next. So I've even had people say things like, for example, coaching some math people to prepare that haven't taught calculus in forever. And you know, they're worried about, am I gonna have to study calculus to take this exam? Well, when you look and if calculus were on here, I can't even remember if calculus is listed on the math one, it might be a bullet in one of these long lists of bullets. So like we did, the, we did the math and realized that if they got a question on some of this content that they didn't know, it might be one or two questions. And so then they started to feel a little better about, oh, okay, good, you know, and really calculating. Um, another thing to keep in mind that we will look at with, with the weighting is really layering um, how much this table of the selected response is worth on the entire assessment and then how much that is worth in your entire score. So there's, you know, it really puts things in perspective when you start to think about the weighting with this too. So just wanted to kind of um, point out that um, you can think about these percentages. Obviously they're not a guarantee, but that's a general guideline 
And when you do the math, that's about how many questions you would have on each one. And it's different for everyone, so mm -hmm. look. Yeah, you're gonna have to do the math on, on the one you have, so. <clears throat> All right, Holly? Well, some things that are just good to know when you're thinking about the constructed response portion. So you do know there are 45 selected response and then three constructed response. So, uh, and we'll talk about the weighting of each section differently and even the scoring, it's, it's you get separate scores for each constructed response. Um, when you do your constructed response, you'll be doing it at the assessment center, on a computer, in a, in a little workstation, you will be typing your response. So that's, I think it's really a great idea to do some practicing in, with that, you know, practice typing for 30 minutes, you know, making up some constructed response items or looking online and finding some old ones and practice typing for 30 minutes. Just so you get a feel for how long that is. Uh, you also need to know in math and music, you have a little response booklet where you're doing some things in a response booklet. So uh, that doesn't apply to either of you, but if someone's watching uh, later, you might want to, to know that. Also, they're not really scoring it for spelling and grammar. So don't get too freaked out about that. And you can use bullets. You probably want to use bullets for some parts of it. And then, of course, if you have time, you can go back and, and make complete sentences. But get the information down first. You have a lot to do in 30 minutes. There are multiple prompts for each of the constructed response items. So some, some people recommend going through and reading all of the different parts of the question before you start. That's just, I guess, depends on how different people work, but you want to make sure that you get to all of the, the different uh, prompts. So don't finish one and think, oh, oh, well, I got that done. That was fast in 30 minutes because there's probably about six more. So the computer will let you go on and look at all of them and go back to different ones. But at 30 minutes, the screen goes blank. So even though you have a certain amount of time for all three of the constructed response, you do not get to divvy it up however you want. You get 30 minutes for each of them. So it will just go blank when 30 minutes is over and that sounds really scary and creepy, but that's what happens. So you'll also have, um, it'll tell you at the top like one of three prompts or that kind of thing. And it also has a clock. So, you know, you can watch your time and not get, you know, bogged down too much, you know, and, and waste too much time if you need to get to some other prompts of that question and go back. So you really do need to practice yeah. the person view uh, tutorial things because you don't want the format to mess you up. If you know the content, you want to be able to show it. So don't let that format mess you up practice so you know what to expect and then when you go in there and sit down you can do the tutorial again and it does not count on your time so I would do that again just to make sure I knew how to use the mouse and the different the you know the computer just the keyboard any questions or anything so far All right. Okay. Let's go on. Okay. So um, some things that you're going to really want to make sure that you have when you're looking at your, um, we, I think we've already talked about the importance of the descriptions from component one and the standards, but something else that you're going to really want in your hands when you're digging into and um, unpacking your constructed response items is the level four rubric. And I know that people are generally pretty good about looking at the rubrics for their portfolio items, or I would say better at looking at their rubrics for their um, portfolio items, but I think people forget that there's rubrics for the constructed response items too. And the, um, the thing that's tricky is that it's hard for us, so we're gonna go through some examples because those rubrics are different for every single 
prompt for every single certificate area. They're very specific, so you'll have to look at your own to really um, see how that looks for your own certificate area. So Holly's got one here as an example. So one of the constructed response items for literacy, so yay, Brittany, is uh, analyze uh, student reading in this exercise. You will analyze a transcript. Got to move the chat box. I can't read it. Analyze a transcript of a student's oral reading. Identify two significant patterns with respect to reading miscues and or fluency. And discuss an appropriate teaching strategy to address one of the identified patterns. So uh, let's let's kind of break that question down. Um, so you know some things that you need to make sure you know how to do is, first of all, analyze. I mean, something you've been doing a lot in your other components. So analyzing an oral reading uh, that's done by a student. So that's probably going to be some kind of running record. So some really good resources for that might be Mari Clay, uh, looking at um, those kinds of uh, tools like that so you could uh, practice running records think about if you have a reading recovery specialist in your building that would be a great colleague to talk to and take some of like maybe practice making some running records so that you could get in the habit of analyzing what those miscues are what's happening what patterns you see reading recovery specialists do that every single day uh, so that might be a really great person to talk to. So you're going to look at a running record and you're going to look for patterns. What kind of mistakes are they making or what kind of miscues are they making that you could address and, and also looking at fluency. And then you're going to choose one of those things and pick a, strat a teaching strategy that could address that pattern. So a lot to do in one constructed response item and a lot to think about in 30 minutes. All right, so, but you know this is gonna be something you will have. To me, it's kind of amazing how much they give you really because this is gonna be one of your constructed response items. So how many things could it be except they're going to give you some kind of running record with a lot of miscues on it and you've got to do these patterns and stuff so you can strategically pattern uh, you can strategically practice some of this so let's look at the next slide and that's just I just copied that on there because that's what it actually looks like on the computer screen for you something kind of like that so it, it'll give you an introduction and it'll tell you how they're going to kind of score it um, but that will basically match the rubric that you will already have memorized, basically. So I would really look at those rubrics in your component one directions, and that way you don't have to spend too much time looking at this criteria for scoring, because you'll already have that in your mind. And again, you'll see clear, consistent, convincing evidence is what they're gonna be looking for. So you need really specific, not generalized, uh, information from the prompt that they give you. All right, so you can see if you have not looked at the tutorial, this is what the screen looks like. The next button down here will let, you know, takes you to the next screen. It, tell, it shows you how much time you have left. So, and it should have your name where it says candidate name. All right. So here is, um, a running kind of a running record of a student and I want to give you all just a, a few minutes to read through this uh, Sam this may be out of your area of expertise but I think you could still do this uh, the key is down at the bottom that tells you what kind of mistakes they were making so just in the chat box since you really can't uh, grab the mic today if you want to List some of the, the patterns. What patterns do you see for some of these miscues?
Hey, we won't judge, Brittany. That's all right. <laughs> So self-correction would be a strength for sure. So the pauses that they're making, um, where do you see those pauses? Why do you think they're making the pauses where they make pauses? to try to figure out words. Okay, good. What kind of words? Yeah, looking at when, so to me, what this child, um, they have a pretty good grasp on, on like high frequency words. Um, it doesn't have a rate or anything on here. So we don't really know like if, but I'm assuming that their rate is pretty good because they have short pauses where we see those lines. So often between um, in two syllable or more words. So multisyllabic words seems to be an area where they are having some issues. So I think that's definitely a pattern we see. Some strengths that we see are their sight words are, they are making some self-corrections, which is great. You really want to capitalize on a student that is making self-corrections because it means they're actually thinking about what they're reading and they're able to note that something doesn't sound right. So when that child says filed honeybees, they realize, oh wait, what's a filed honeybee? That doesn't make any sense. So they're going back to say, to change it to feel there. They see that there's two vowels there. So they probably have heard that when there's two vowels, you know, usually it's going to make one of those vowel sounds. So there are a lot of good things that this child is doing. The, I would say the thing that I would capitalize on would to, to move this child forward would be looking at uh, multisyllabic words. So they are kind of breaking them up fairly well into syllables, it looks like. Like honeybees, I mean, they got it right. So I think um, what kind of strategies might we do to work on words with more than one syllable? There are some uh, generalizations that we could teach them about how words work with multisyllables. So we would uh, do some of that kind of teaching. We might look at um, how to break words up into syllables. And there, you know, you could um, do a strategy where you circle prefixes or circle suffixes and look for roots. You could. Um, like they, the like deposit, they're always like the, the, the vowel sounds. We might want to teach them, I mean, some vocabulary instruction would be probably good because they're not recognizing that that's not a word when he says depose it, the house bees depose it. So we could do some vocabulary instruction also. But those are the kinds of things that you need to do when you're looking at your practice sample, you know, the sample things that you have. So get other, get a team of teachers together and like how, like what are some different ways that you could teach uh, multisyllable words, you know, like, and look up those kinds of things. So I would take something like this. If I were practicing myself, I would take this and I would list all the strengths. And it's really always good to think in terms of how could I take those strengths to then work on the weaker areas. And so then I would think of what would be the next thing that this child might need to, to work on. And we could talk about multisyllable words. And then look up 
like get some good um, like Isabel Beck or some of the well-known names in vocabulary instruction and and then you could really get some strategies for teaching multi-syllabic words. So that's the kind of thing I would do to prepare for this question. Also, uh, get with reading recovery teachers because they do this every day. All right, so Brittany, sorry that you've got to go. Is that what that says? And um, No, she, I don't think she has to go. She was just saying she doesn't feel very okay. strong at this, but that's okay, that's why we're studying. Yeah. yeah. So the next example is, far away from my expertise or Holly's. We just wanted to kind of walk through one that um, to really show the difference or what could be the difference in, um, an, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot the rubric. The level four rubric, uh, it's pretty much what that opening slide said. There, you're gonna uh, analyze uh, for patterns and with respect to the reading miscues, and then um, an appropriate teaching strategy to identify one of those patterns, and then an explanation of how that strategy will promote reading development is detailed and sensible. So, um, so you can't just, like one of the things that's helpful for me on this rubric is it's not just saying this is a pattern, and you know, not just to identify two patterns, but then to actually cite evidence from the transcript so that you're really like if you yeah. right so you wouldn't be able to get a level four without then connecting your evidence to the transcript to really justify even if you chose one that they thought was the right answer this is also saying you have to include examples in the transcript to get a level four it's exactly what we teach our kids to do with these constructed response how you have to cite evidence from the passage mm -hmm. you know, we preach that at school for our kids on these tests that they're going to be doing and that's what we have to do too right and from the text and then you have to say why you would use that strategy whatever strategy you decide to to kind of promote for their next step then you need to explain how that strategy is going to help them with their reading development. So you have to think about how that strategy fits into their like long-term development of reading. All right. So this next example, I intentionally chose something I know virtually nothing about. <laughs> and, and I don't think Holly does either. And it doesn't sound like we chose Brittany and Sam's expertise here either. But um, just to give you an example of how we can analyze these things, just to get a sense of how you would unpack a prompt. So um, we wanted to choose one that was a little more content based and less pedagogy. So obviously you have to know your reading content to be able to teach people reading, but that wasn't the teacher demonstrating their own reading ability, that's the teacher analyzing student reading ability. So um, we chose, uh, I chose this prompt from social studies, uh, from high school social studies, and this is to um, look at regional economic and geographic trends. Um, so for this, you have to look at, um, you're, you're gonna use your knowledge of economics and geography to identify an economic or geographic trend in a map or graph. Explain two reasons for the trend, and you'll also analyze one economic and geographic effect of this trend on the region identified on the map and graph and be asked to respond to one prompt. So, when you look at this question, what are some things that you may expect to see or things that are really important that you have to do? So I know, I know just from the words in here that it's going to either be a map or a graph. So um, they're not going to ask me to read anything or um, it's that, that my prompt is going to be a map or a graph no matter what. They're not going to throw me any surprises. 
So, um, and that it's going to have something to do with economics and geography. There's not going to be anything in a, like another type of, of social studies or history. And there's a few things I'm going to have to do, which will be outlined in the rubric too, but that I have to explain, I have to find a trend, to explain two reasons why that could be a trend. And then I need to really um, think about the effect of the trend. So I don't know a lot about these trends. So, but I do want to show you an example of this is a released prompt for this. So this one would be a map. And they're asking me to look for the trends. So I don't even know um, a lot about, I don't know anything about like the nourishment in hunger in East and South Asian countries in 2011. But I can tell you on this graph that, or on this map, that it looks like there's a big difference when you just look at the colors um, for South Korea and Japan that very few people are hungry when you compare that to the rest of East and South um, and Southern Asia. So that would be one trend that I could look at. And then I would be asked to say why I think that that's a trend and then the effect that that's had on the region. So I am not even going to pretend to know this content, but this would be um, an example of how you would analyze this prompt. The rubric for this one is that I have to say two reasons for the train trend that is detailed and substantive. Um, and I would imagine that you'd have to show your expertise of what was going on in South Korea and in Japan that has led to less hunger, economic trends. Um, you're also going to have to have an economic effect of the trend um, and then a geographic effect of that. Okay, so um, this is not at all about what would, how would you teach this to students? This is, do you understand this idea of why there's, um, why the map looks like this and what that means? So we just wanted to show an example too of the, the, the fact that those prompts read very differently when you're looking at um, whether or not you're showing your expertise or whether or not you're showing your expertise on how to teach students. So uh, any questions about that? All right, well, uh, looking like just did the next slide here at talking about time and how much time you have for the different parts of the assessment center exercises. So for the selected response items, you have 60 minutes and then you have a 10 minute break. You can, but I read that they don't tell you when your 10 minutes is over exactly. I mean, you need to don't wander too far off and when your 10 minutes is up, you need to know that they're not going to necessarily tell you your 10 minutes are up. So, and I don't even think you can leave your test area. I, I think you might be right. If you You'd do, have to get permission. I, yeah, I think you can, like if you need to use the restroom or something, but you have to like check back in or something. So just make sure you can't, you need to read the directions for that because I'm not positive. I don't remember. So just, you need to know. Then you have 30 minutes for each of the three constructed response questions. And like I said before, you can't divvy it up how you want to. You have 30 minutes, then a black screen. So uh, you at least will get to all of, all of them because they will make sure that, that you do. All right. Um, the time is 75 minutes for, and it lists the ones there that, that need a little extra time. Some of those are the ones where you actually have to write in a little test booklet and stuff. But One of the things um, that is a, a strategy that I don't know that we've mentioned later that I, um, that I think I know that it can be scary for people to think that I have 30 minutes and then my screen changes and there's not, you know, like I don't, 
if I didn't feel good about that prompt, I kind of, now my screen's changed and now what, right? Um, and I vividly remember when I was um, testing that quite honestly, there was a point in the test where I was mentally exhausted and I just kind of drew a blank on the question they were asking me. And I was really struggling through this one question. Just was really having a hard time with it. And um, there was something about the fact that I was panicking about, oh my gosh, I'm running out of time. But then at the same time, when I ran out of time and the screen changed, I thought, oh my goodness, I get to start over. Like, now this is a new question. This one scored completely differently. And I can bring myself back. And when I got my scores back later, I did my, I didn't do real well on the one I felt like I was struggling through, you know, but then the next question I did awesome. And so you're going to have to really mentally make sure that you can bring yourself back in, in that situation. If, if you do find that you're struggling, like use that as an opportunity to think you could start again. If you, if you really thought one question was hard, instead of thinking of it as, Oh no, the screen's going to change. Like it could be a great, I get to do any question. <laughs> All right. Well, on that testing day, be sure that you get there early. Um, you just want to make sure that you have plenty of time to get checked in and everything. So things that I've read suggest arriving 30 minutes early. You might want to dress in layers. They will not let you wear a coat in there, but you can wear a sweater, that kind of thing. Just, um, it, it, some of those places are kind of cold. So um, you will be asked to sign an agreement in the beginning that you're not allowed to talk about the assessment center exercises outside of, you know, af afterward. You can't share with other people what your questions were. You, you're just really not allowed to talk about it. That's one reason we chose things uh, to, to demonstrate today. I'm not uh, certified in literacy because I thought if I showed you one that was one of mine or, you know, if one of the prompts that was too similar to what I had that I might be kind of stepping on over that line a little bit. So you, because it's the kind of test that it is, you're just, you're not allowed to, to share those questions with other people. You want to make sure that your photo ID matches the name they have on record. So if you have received your permission to test or whatever it is that you that you get when you were supposed to sign up for the test, make sure that that name matches what's on your ID and it needs to be a photo ID like a driver's license. So there is a list of acceptable IDs. I think a driver's license is 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 perfect so I would just use that but just make sure the name is the same um, there are a few little comfort aids that you're allowed to have um, you can have um, some a tissue some tissue you can have uh, I think a cough drop or something like that and you can actually have a cushion but it can't have a cover on it and that's all I can think of. Can you think of any other comfort aids they're allowed to take in? No, they're really strict about yeah. that. They'll give you earplugs too, um, if headphones. you want them, or headphones, so that if you want to block out background noise, like that's one of the things they offer when you're there. Okay. Uh, and then also just, if uh, this won't apply to either of you, but you don't get to take in your own calculator they will have an online scientific calculator for math and science. Right. <clears throat> so uh, just a few other little things that might uh, make things a little bit easier for you. If possible, go the day before, just so you know where it is. I had a hard time finding, and this was not for my original one, but when I was just doing a field test, they had some in Paducah. And so since it was a field test, I didn't go early or anything because it didn't really count. But I, I was really glad that it wasn't my real test because I had a hard time finding where I was supposed to go. It was not well labeled or anything. And it was summer and people weren't on campus because it was on a university campus. So I had a hard time finding the place. So 
if you can, uh, if you're going to go spend the night or something, go before or go maybe more than 30 minutes early if you're going that day, just so you can be sure and find it. When you get there, you might want to do that tutorial at your station so you're really familiar with your computer and how it works. And that might just help settle your nerves too, just to kind of go through that. Uh, they do have a way that you can flag selected response questions. So you might go through and do the best you can on them, but ones that you're really not sure about, you could flag and go back to those to do a little more thinking. I or, recommend answering them. Yeah, I do too. too. Even though you flag them, so that if you don't have a chance to go back or you forget to go back, they will be answered. Right. And you are encouraged to guess if you don't know. It does not it's not worse for you to guess. Yeah, you don't get counted off that way or anything. Right. If you get them wrong, you just don't get the points. So, um, and then just be sure, of course, to read carefully. And then just to watch the clock because you will have a clock on your screen all the time. So just kind of know, be aware of your time so that you don't get caught off guard when, when it's over. Right. Um, we wanted to make sure that you understand the weighting of this um, component as well. And the, this graph shows the, all of the components. So when you look at this I mean chart, excuse me, the pie chart, 40% um, of, so all of the yellow is component one. So 40% of your entire score, um, yes, Sam, the flag button is available for each question. It's part of the tutorial that you'll see too. That that's a that's a thing that they'll teach you on the tutorial. So um, the yellow um, is the component one, and you can see that that's forty percent of the entire score of your of um, the national board score. So it's kind of overwhelming a little when you think that like that this one component is worth forty percent, and component three is thirty, and components four and two are fifteen percent each. So it really, um, it is a big part of the score. Um, but it's helpful to know, I, there's a couple advantages to having this, um, to having this be one of them. Um, one of the advantages of it is that you actually get four scores. So um, you'll get a score for your selected response, which is half of the total score of component two, um, excuse me, component one. So that's 20% of your overall score, but half of your component one score is just the multiple choice. And then the other half is divided evenly between those constructed response items, and you'll get a score on each one. So the good thing is, is you'll get an overall score, and then you'll get a score for each one. And if you decide, like, I did really poorly on the multiple choice, you can just redo the multiple choice if you end up having to retake anything in the long run. And um, you do have to have a score of at least a 1.75 on your component one um, as a whole in order to not have to redo anything. That doesn't mean that you've passed component one or that you're gonna certify. Um, that just means that you don't have to redo anything in component one. Um, you might still have to redo something if you don't hit your overall passing score once you look at all of your components. But um, the floor score is just to ensure that people are a balance of content knowledge and um, being able to teach students. So um, they wanted to ensure with, with the um, new release of National Board with 3.0 that there was this assurance that there was a balance, that, that there couldn't be somebody who did so well on the portfolio components and did so badly on the content knowledge that they still certified or vice versa, that they, they did perfect on the content test, but then really did horribly on the portfolio ass assessments, and they didn't want those people to certify. They want to make sure that you're at least a 1.75 on your entire portfolio as an average for your floor score and your entire component one as a floor score. So the good news is, is you'll know that you've met your floor score when you get your component one scores back, and you'll get a pretty good sense of your, of your score how you're doing because this is almost, I mean, 40% is a large part of your, it's almost half. So of your um, score for all of the national board process. Um, 
if you decide to redo anything in, like if you wanted to redo a section, those costs are also prorated. So you wouldn't have to pay the 475 again. It would be a, a portion of that um, since you'd just be redoing a portion if you end up redoing anything. Are there any questions on the weighting and scoring? Yes, you will also get those scores when you get, uh, when all of the scores are released. The last two years, those have been released in December. Um, sometimes they've been released as early as November, but um, I would expect those to come mid to late December. That's been the trend lately. Um, some people ask, you know, why don't we get those scores any sooner? Um, because it's a computer assessment, but um, the only thing that would be scored right away is the multiple choice, but they, they give that out as one score or one package when they give all the scores out because your um, constructed response items are scored, double blind scored by NBCTs that are trained to do those um, scoring just like in the portfolio. It takes a lot of time for that to, have, to get accomplished. We had some other strategies. Go ahead, Holly. I was just going to say, when you go, um, they, a whiteboard and a marker are available as a tool for you at the assessment center. You don't take your own, but they should offer you that. Uh, some people like to use those and some people don't. It's totally up to you and how you work. But people use them for different things. Like if you were studying about, um, I remember for, for mine, and I did the old one, so I don't even think this is part of the new one, but one thing had to do with the big ideas in science. And so I created a little way to remember those big ideas in science. And as soon as I got in that assessment center, I jotted that down so I didn't have to remember it anymore. So you can uh, jot down things that you want to be sure not to forget if there are certain um, I don't know, standards, or maybe maybe you just want to give yourself a little note about standards, um, a comp, like the, don't forget to think about the, um, you know, the double helix about accomplished teaching. You know, maybe there's just something you want to not forget to include. You could jot that down. Or if you want to make a little plan, uh, for your question response, but you just don't have a lot of time to do much pre-writing. No, it could be like that you have like these three big things. Like if it's, you know, something like what are two ways, what are the weaknesses for this child or a strength or, you know, identify misconception and then two things you're going to do. Like you may want to write down the misconception and the two things you want to do, like and just bullet them so that you don't forget when you're writing that what those are or you could type those right into the thing if you're somebody who likes to, to work more that way um, you can I don't know that you can start writing on it before the test starts they will let you know that when you get to the test center um, it might be considered part of your time but what I have generally found when I've talked to people that have taken the selected response and I took the selected response um, as a field test I had plenty of time on my selected response. So that would be, I think you would have time either at the beginning or end of your selected response if you wanted to do a little bit of a brain dump. I think you could do that during that time because you do the selected response first, I think, and then the constructed response. So um, you can also, there might be acronyms that you use or mnemonics to help. I had one that um, my mentor taught me ages ago and it was I still remember that it was a C I A heart <laughs> and that was an acronym that, that had to do with things like C was for collaboration and, and then like H was for home and E was for equity and A was assessment. Um, and each of those were some of the big ideas that appeared in my standards and T was technology. And so we had these different, um, ideas that if it was going to, because I'm um, in an early childhood area, a lot of my prompts are like, how would you teach a child this? So really thinking about, is there a way to weave in technology? Is there a way to weave in collaboration? Is there a way to, like, how am I going to know that the child understands this? So do I need to include assessment in my answer? And obviously you're not just going to want to include things that are not a part of the prompt, but it helped me to write some well-rounded answers to my prompts because I had some of those things at the front of my mind, like Holly was saying with the big ideas of, of science. No, you don't have to erase between sections. Um, 
some people like I have, I know people that write themselves like you can do this or something. Like if there's something you need to look at, like do that. Right. (laughs) Or it might be that you want to, um, if there's something about the rubric that you're really struggling to remember to, you know, like, don't forget, like, you know, you're going to have, you already know what's going to, that's on those rubrics. Like if you're forgetting the why, why you teach this, then write down, don't forget the why. Um, And if you've studied the questions, you know, the, the little things that they give you, the scenario things that they give you in advance. And let's say you're doing that question on literacy and you're typing about the miscues that you see and the, the identifying two, you know, issues that they have. But then as you're doing that, uh, like a strategy or something pops in your mind that you don't want to forget, then you could jot it down real fast so that you have it when you go to the next part of that question. I'm pretty bad about like, I think of something great and then five minutes later, I can't remember it. So, well, and that can be especially true when you're in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. So just use that as another um, tool at your disposal. Um, We've talked a lot about the tutorial and the place to find where to download that platform is in the assessment center policy guidelines. And it's important to point out that there are a lot of other important details in there that you really need to take a look at that. Holly gleaned a lot of the information in there about the specifics from the assessment center. But if you have other questions, it's not gonna hurt to go in there and just double check and make sure that you've really thought through everything and that you haven't overlooked any aspect of the center and that you feel prepared. And that's where that link, which um, is listed in the guide, is where you go to learn more about the platform and you can actually download the tutorial. And I don't know if you all have people working with you or if you know other people that are going through the same certificate area as you are. But to me, this is one of the most powerful things you can do is meet with other people doing the same thing and just brainstorm. What could they ask? What should I study? What resources are the best? And divvy it up, kind of. Like, could you find stuff on visual literacy and you find stuff on writing and you find stuff on, you know, miscue analysis? So that you can divvy up some of that stuff and then bring those resources together and share. Like, if you... Uh, you know, each one become an expert on something and then share with each other, you could get a lot more bang for your buck, I think. So um, people ask us a lot, like, where do you, how did you study or where did you go to get information? And I I think there's a lot of different places that you can go, but I think one of the best ways to consider studying is to think about when you're teaching, where do you go? When you now, like if you're not taking a test and there's something that you wanted to learn more about, how do you typically learn more about that thing? Are you somebody that likes to research, um, look at journals, or find like great teaching books? Do you like to talk to other teachers that you know? Um, Do you like to go to training? Where is it that you, um, do you look online? Where is it that you go for your information um, when you need to know a new topic? Twitter, listservs, magazines, those are good suggestions. Um, Books and trainings. So I did a combination of those things when I was studying, um, but I, I, um, what I generally did when I looked through my standards and looked through the prompts, um, as we've talked about, really analyzing those prompts, is I identified what my weak areas were. And it sounds like, I know, Brittany, you've even talked about, like, I don't feel really good about this one topic yet. And that's important you know that. That's, that's huge that you can identify this is an area where I feel like is my weakness. Um, obviously, analyzing maps would be an area for me if I, if I were taking that test, um, which it's not my content expertise, um, but I'm not a social studies teacher. So, um, so really thinking about where you need to know more, um, and maybe like prioritizing if, is this an area where I, and you could do that on your tables, like writing, right in your, um, table for your selected response and in your, um, three lists of your constructive response, like really thinking about, is this, is this something I feel like I have this pretty well and I just might want to review and maybe practice a prompt? Or is this something that I feel is really a weakness and I need to know more? 
where am I going to, and actually write down where you're going to learn more. So, um, for example, one of the things that you have to consider is that um, you have to be prepared to answer questions for the entire developmental range of your certificate. When I took the assessment, I was a preschool teacher, and I was getting asked questions all the way up to third grade. And the way my certificate works is I'm not even certified in Kentucky beyond kindergarten. So I'm only certified to teach preschool and kindergarten, but I knew that I was gonna be asked questions up to third grade. So what I did was I went to the very best first grade teacher, second grade teacher, and third grade teacher I could find, and I asked them for some time, and I went with a list of questions. And I knew, for example, that I was gonna have a, a question that was about a topic in science and how you teach it, like a big idea in science. So I said, what are the big ideas that you teach in second grade? What are your favorite lessons for teaching those things? Another one I knew I was gonna have to an answer was like a math misconception. So I asked each one of them, what's a big math misconception or math misconceptions that you see at your grade level? And what are your favorite lessons to teach those? Um, or I would ask them, I knew that a weakness for me, Brittany, um, I can definitely relate, was this idea of reading running records and really analyzing literacy. And I felt really weak in that area. So I asked a reading coach, a prime, a, a, an elementary reading coach, I said, what books should I be reading? Where, where should I go to learn more information? And I asked her if I could borrow her books. I did not spend any money when I was studying for the assessment center. I didn't buy anything, I borrowed books, um, I asked some questions online and listers for like other people like what are some ideas of questions you think that we might get on this one, you know, really brainstorming with other people and Holly talked about getting together with people in person if you can to study. Well, I didn't feel like I had a lot of that in person, but I found a lot of that online. So either way, like generating ideas about what are some things that might they might ask us about when they when they're asking us about this specific prompt. Um, and then really even writing some sample questions, timing yourself, and really making sure that you're ready to go. But, um, but the answer, some people buy flashcards and study books, and, um, and I have heard people say that that's helpful, but I don't think you have to. Um, I think you can just consider your, what the style you're comfortable with too. Holly, do you have other tips, or did you guys have questions about that? Well, I made sure I found textbooks, uh, for the grade levels that I didn't teach, you know, especially math and science textbooks. I know like I was early childhood generalist and I, I, I got the health book from the third grade and the second grade because I taught first grade and I was really lucky because it really helped. I mean, it, it was like I had a third grade question about health that I didn't, I had never taught anything in that. So it was really helpful for me. Also, I think now you're lucky in the sense that the core content is so out there, you could really look across grade levels uh, through the core content and see what, you know, what are kind of the expectations for the different grade levels. All right. Um, any other questions that you all have? We didn't have any questions in the chat box that we haven't addressed already, but just to open it up if you all have any more questions. Because those are all of our slides. So if you wanna um, ask us anything, then feel free to do that. Well, good luck. Yeah. I'm gonna stop recording. I can get that to come back up.